there may be many times every day that we begin a sentence with those two words, I am, and then there's a word that follows. And it may be, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, uh, maybe I'm thin, I'm not so thin, or, uh, or maybe I'm a Republican, or I'm a Democrat, I'm for Hillary, I'm for Trump, I'm um, whatever. We always use those words, I am, to describe our situation in life or describe our setting at the time. Probably the best words to follow the words I am, as I am a follower of Jesus, right? But Jesus used those words seven times in the book of the, the Gospel of John, and each time he used those words, those words shared something extremely significant about him, about who he was, or what he was going to do. And uh, in this sermon series called I Am, we're focusing in on the seven I Ams of Jesus from the Gospel of John. He's going to be, we're going to be sharing the third one today from John chapter 10, if you want to join me in your Bible or your devices today, John 10. And he's going to be speaking in a parable. A parable is a, it's a story that has a, a, a meaning, but that meaning may be obvious to some who have ears to hear, but that meaning may be concealed for those who are not ready for the truth yet. So let me talk to you a little bit about the setting for John chapter 10, where Jesus shares a parable about, if you haven't guessed it already, sheep and a shepherd, where he says, I am the door. The setting, we have to go back, and I think the events of chapter 9 precede what we find in chapter 10. In, in chapter 9, we have the story of the man born blind. Now, how many of you were not here last week? Okay, a few of you. Let me fill you in, because those who were here last week remember the story perfectly, okay? There was a man who was born blind uh, in the city of Jerusalem. Uh, he'd never seen a sunrise or a sunset, um, he, but now he's of full age. And so the disciples were asking Jesus one day, they said, which, which man sinned? Who sinned that this, this man should be born blind? Is it his own sin that causes blindness or it was his parents' sin? Jesus said, it's neither one. This is for the purpose of the glory of God. Jesus spit on the ground and made some mud with that spit and put it in the man's eyes and told, told the man, go to the pool of Siloam and there, uh, wash yourself and you'll be clean. And he did. And the man was miraculously healed. And so, so this really bothered the religious leaders of the time called Pharisees. And so they were very upset uh, because Jesus didn't fit into their system and they couldn't control him. Uh, they couldn't perform miracles and he did. And so they called this man who was blind, but now he can see. His neighbors recognize it. Now the Pharisees come and said, what happened to you? And he said, this man um, put mud on the ground, put it on my eyes, and now I can see. Well, who is he? Well, he's the, the prophet. Uh, they weren't satisfied, and so they called this man's parents in, and they interrogated this man's parents. Uh, couldn't get the right answers from them because the parents caught in a bind if they told what happened to him, they may get thrown out of the synagogue, which is a big deal in that little Jewish town, uh, Jerusalem. And so what they, they said, listen, he's old enough, he's of age, you go ask him what happened to him. So the Pharisees again went and asked this man, what happened to you? He said, listen, all I can tell you, I was once blind, now I can see. And the chapter ends with a man who was born blind, now physically seeing and spiritually seeing. His eyes are open to who Jesus is. But the chapter also ends with a, with a group of Pharisees, religious leaders, who are physically able to see, spiritually blind, and they throw this man out of the synagogue, out of the temple. Jesus, I think, in that setting, he wants to make a statement that you Pharisees don't, are not the door to the kingdom. I am. I am the door. You can throw people out of organizations, but I'll, I'll determine who gets into the kingdom or the sheepfold, not you. And so he, he shares a story with them from John chapter 10 where he's going to really uh, make it clear that he is the door, the only door to life eternal. John chapter 10, let me read just the first uh, five verses. Um, John 10, Jesus said, we know this, it's red letters. Truly, truly, I say to you, 
He who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. When he, was brought, uh, when he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of a stranger. I love the fact that this passage, these verses, share us three truths about Jesus being the door. The first one is that we should come to the door that gives life. And in these verses, we find that Jesus is sharing a story, but he's building on a metaphor in this parable, a metaphor that we find in the Old Testament where God is the shepherd and the children of Israel are the sheep. And the psalmist, David, writes in the famous psalm, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Many of you know that psalm. We find that same motif that's used of shepherd and sheep throughout the Old Testament. In Psalm 80, Isaiah 40, you find that often, that God is the shepherd. But now he's saying, Jesus is saying, I'm the shepherd of those who follow me. I am the shepherd. In order to understand this well, we have to understand sheep. I grew up on a farm, but we didn't have sheep. How many of you grew up on sheep farms? Okay, I don't see anybody. Oh, we're right here. Okay, well, well done. <laughs> well, you know all about sheep then. But um, what I've learned about sheep from reading is that sheep have no sense of direction. None. Some of you may be old enough to remember a television program that, that starred a dog. And the, there was a young man, a boy, who had this dog. The boy's name was Timmy. Anybody guess the dog's name? Lassie. Oh, great. Nickelodeon or, um, or else you're old. Um, <laughs> but it was so cool about the story is that Lassie was an amazing dog. It may have been in the, the plot line that maybe a traveling salesman stops by the house uh, to sell something to Timmy's parents. He sees the dog. He wants the dog. So he puts the dog, when Timmy's not watching, in the trunk of his car, and he travels all the way across the country. And finally, when he's going to open up the trunk, Lassie jumps out and starts running. I mean, days have gone by. He starts running. There's an open door in a traveling train, boxcar. Lassie jumps in. And Lassie's there for a day or two, but he knows exactly when to jump out. And you see him running through the landscape, running through streets, running through woods. And then finally, you remember Timmy always left his window open. And Lassie would jump in. And when Timmy would wake up the next morning and the music would get soft, and then he'd look over and see Lassie. He could tell the same kind of stories about a, a dolphin named Flipper, okay? I've never seen a program about a sheep. <laughs> Have you? The ranchers will tell you that if you take a sheep over one hill away from the corral, the sheep is lost. So close and yet lost. And maybe that's why Jesus said, were sheep. So close, but lost. And we need a shepherd. We need a shepherd. So we learn about sheep. Correct me if I'm wrong on any of this now, because mine's just through reading. A sheep has no sense of direction. A, a sheep has no real means of protection. Some, some animals have claws and some have sharp teeth. Uh, some have fangs. Some of them can run fast. A sheep has none of that. So if we were a sheepfold this morning, and a door over here, and a, a, a wolf comes into the sheepfold, what are we going to do, sheep? If he comes in this corner, we're going to scurry to that corner, and we're going to huddle together. And who's the wolf going to get? The slowest one into the corner. So John, 
It's probably you or me. Yeah. Well, I'll race you to the corner. But a sheep has no means of protection. And aren't you glad the Bible says the Lord is our shepherd and he provides protection? His rod and staff, they comfort us. The third thing I know about sheep, correct me if I'm wrong, a sheep has no means of cleaning themselves. Some of you have cats and dogs in your houses, right? And you've watched them go into contortions like pretzels so they can lick their back and clean themselves. Um, uh, snakes will shed their skin. Uh, even pigs. Pigs that are often known to be a dirty animal. Uh, actually, what, what I do know about pigs is that they'll, they'll slop around in the mud. But that's actually good because the mud removes the parasites off them. And the mud also provides a sunscreen for them and keeps them cool. Sheep have nothing. Not a thing. In fact, to complicate the problem, they have this wool that collects branches and, and spurs and, and thistles and weeds and dirt. And so a farmer, motivated obviously by the sale of the wool, will shear the sheep. But in, in the process of shearing the sheep, he's doing the sheep a great service. He's cleaning and cleansing the sheep and also allowing the sheep to stay cool in the hot weather. And we, like sheep, have no means of cleansing ourselves, do we? Nothing. And that's why we need a shepherd. And the shepherd we have shed his blood that a sheep would be clean eternally. Well, that's what we know about sheep. Um, let me talk to you just for a second about sheep folds so we can really understand the story that Jesus is talking about. In the, in the video, you saw two different kinds of sheep folds. The first kind you'd find out in the countryside. And it would be a sheep fold where it would be a rock wall so the sheep couldn't get out. And the rock wall may be circular, oval shape, um, uh, around like that with one opening. And you had to go through, the sheep would go through that, uh, and the shepherd would be the gatekeeper for that. Uh, the other kind of sheep fold, and by the way, when Jesus talks, he's, he's alluding to one and then to the other, back and forth. This sheepfold would be a sheepfold that would be in the city. It would be much larger, made for more than one flock. And so when shepherds would bring their sheep into the city, like at Jerusalem, they'd take them into the sheepfold. And there may be several flocks in there, manned by several shepherds. There would be a hired gatekeeper who would watch the flock, not letting any shepherd in who didn't belong or didn't have a, a flock in there. So when the morning would come, the shepherd would go in, and he's not going to be able to tell his sheep apart through name tags or, or, or wristbands or anything like that. So he goes in, and he speaks. He knows them by name. They recognize his voice. So we learn something here about the shepherd. The, first of all, the shepherd has a relationship with the sheep. He calls them his own. He knows them by name. And they listen to his voice. So you have a relationship, you have ownership, you have care. And then when he leads them out, they follow. So we learn about the sheep, that there's voice recognition. We also learn about the sheep that when he calls, and he calls them by name and they hear his voice, they follow him. Jesus said, thieves and robbers came in before me, but I'm the shepherd of the sheep. When you read this, um, to me it's, it's, it's really reassuring for what God is trying to do and what God is trying to communicate to us. And yet he shares this with the people and probably uh, the audience at that time would have been his disciples, some Jews, perhaps some Pharisees, and maybe even the blind man who was healed in the ninth chapter. Everybody understands that, right? No, not so much. Notice verse 6. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So we have the setting, we have the story. Now Jesus is going to do us a big favor, and he's going to share the significance. But more than share the significance of the story he just told, <clears throat> he's going to expand on that story 
and give us more truth than what we find in verses 1 through 5. <clears throat> so let's notice what he says in verses uh, 7 through 10. This is the significance. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go out in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And he goes on to say, I'm the good shepherd, which will be next week. You read this, and when he, just those words, I am the door. The I in, this, in these four words, the I is by the placement in the text in that sentence is meant to be emphatic. I, I Jesus and only Jesus, am the door. The, the, the definite article before door in the construction makes the subject and the, the object interchangeable. Where Jesus says, I deity am the one who am the, is the door. I don't just open the door, I am the door. And in those verses he said, it's for by me that you'll have salvation exclusively. This is a hard message today, folks. In our world today, in our culture, where uh, this, the, the emphasis in the postmodern culture is that truth is relative and truth is personal. And so uh, you may have a belief system and that's true to you. You may have a belief system and that's true to you. You may have a belief system and that's true to you. And no truth is greater than any other truth. So we just need to get along with everybody's truth. And then along comes Jesus who said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes unto the Father but by me. There is a door, and I am it. I am the door. And so to apply this or to understand this, folks, it's, it's the recognition that salvation only comes through Jesus. There's no other way. No other way. And there are some people who take and misunderstand, misinterpret uh, John 14, where it says, In my Father's house are many mansions or dwelling places, or rooms. And so they'll interpret from that there's a room for uh, the Catholics, and there's a room for, for Baptists, and there's a room for uh, Charismatics, and there's a room for Islam, and there's, there's a room there for Hindus. And it all sounds wonderful, it just there's no truth to it. If you just drop down a couple more verses to get to verse 6, Jesus made it very clear. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. So the first thing we have to do, folks, is come to the door, the only door that gives life. Uh, the second thing we, we can recognize from verses 7 through 10, where Jesus is explaining to us that he is the door and he will protect that wolves have to go through Jesus to get to us. So we need to rest and, and rejoice in Jesus' protection from verse number 9. Rest and rejoice. When you read that, I am the door and I will protect. Picture this, um, the, the, the sheep pulled this out in the wilderness. And I can imagine this is the setting for uh, David, who is the shepherd of Psalm 23. It's out in the wilderness, it's on the countryside, and the sheep are in the sheepfold at night, and David is there as the gatekeeper, as the shepherd, and he looks up into the heavens and he says, and the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. As he, just as he is the shepherd to the flock. He is the protector. We read in that psalm, his rod and his staff, they comfort me. We read in that psalm, he says, you anoint my head with oil. You lead me to still waters. That's what shepherds do. Shepherds don't just lead the sheep to water. They lead them to still water. The rushing waters of a torrential river will scare a sheep. Or if a sheep should slip from the bank into the river, it has no means of survival. And the shepherd would know that. So the good shepherd would protect the sheep and take the sheep through the still waters. You anoint my head with oil. When a sheep was injured, it would be the shepherd who would take the oil and anoint uh, that wound, whether it be the head or somewhere else, because the shepherd protected the sheep. And so the shepherd would, would lie across the opening of that gate. Jesus did that, and he'll protect us. 
What does that mean to you? I hope you rest and rejoice in that. That we, the sheep, in the sheepfold, are protected by an incredible shepherd who cares so much about us. He says to us as his sheep, he says, I will walk through the valleys with you. When you go through the fire, Isaiah 43, I'm going to be with you. When you go through deep waters, I, the shepherd, will go with you. And even when the church is attacked, as it is today around the world and to, to increasing degrees in the United States, we hear the words of the shepherd. He says, I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We have a, a shepherd protector. Rest and rejoice in that, friends. He is our shepherd protector. But there's one more thing I want us to get from this, the teaching of Jesus. And where he says to them in verses 9 and 10, he says, I will give you uh, abundant life. He will go in and out and find pasture. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Abundant life? It's having things in abundance, right? Don't let me get away with that one. You know better, don't you? Abundant life does not go with having things in abundance. We all know people who have things in abundance and don't have an abundant life. Their lives are empty. And maybe that's the story that some of you have had in your lifetime. You've had abundance, but you found in your abundance you were still empty. And in that emptiness led you to the only one who could satisfy, and that's Jesus. In an earlier service this morning, our choir sang, uh, Jesus, just give me Jesus. Take the world, but give me Jesus. To experience the abundant life, is to know the truth that the Apostle Paul was teaching in Colossians chapter 2. For he says, in Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So in, in Jesus, you have all of deity and all the resources of deity. But then he says, and we are complete in Jesus. So that if you have Jesus, you have everything that you need. You have Jesus, you have everything that you need. I read the story of a missionary in Mexico who was trying to, to reach a tribal group there, but he was having all kinds of difficulty because the tribal group had what he called the scarcity view. In other words, they thought many of them, many families would just have one child because they thought if they had two children, their love would have to be split 50% of the first child, 50% of the second child. If they had four children, their love would have to be split 25, 25, 25, and 25. And so he was trying to get across to them the gospel of Jesus. And he was having all kinds of difficulty because they had become greedy. In their scarcity view, they thought there's a pie of all the resources and even of all love. And that pie could be divided up into portions and you had to grab and hold on to what you've been given because there was no more. Aren't you glad that his love has no limits? His grace has no measure. His power has no boundaries known unto men. That all of us can experience abundant life through Jesus. That in him we have everything we need. This is counterintuitive to what the world is teaching today. They said, you're not going to be happy unless you have this, 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 and this. And Jesus said, I have come that you might have life, and you might have abundant life. The greatest life in the world is the life of living for Jesus. How do we respond to this, folks? Let me share two, two broad categories. First, how do we as believers respond that are sheep in the sheepfold? That when Jesus walks in one day and sees us, we hear his voice, he calls us by name, and he leads us to eternal pastures. How do we respond to that? How do we respond to the protection we have and the abundant life that we have in Christ in worship? We just respond in worship, and it's like every day of our lives, we wake up 
and are so thankful that we have Jesus in our lives. Our day is not determined by the weather. Our day is not determined by the circumstances. Our day is determined by the fact that we're sheep having the greatest shepherd of all time, Jesus. We respond in worship. I think we also respond by following through in the commandment of Jesus to bring people to the door. The door of salvation is open. It's our responsibility, those of us who've gone through it, to bring others to Jesus. I want us to do that at Woodside Bible. I want us desperately to take that seriously. That we have a responsibility, and that's not just to get through life or to enjoy abundant life. It's to lead other people to experience what we have. Let's join in together in doing that in the days ahead by sharing the gospel, by being obedient to the command of our shepherd where he says, go, make disciples of all nations. So that's how, we, as believers, if you're a sheep uh, and Jesus is your shepherd, rejoice in that, worship him, follow him wherever he leads you and bring others to the door. For those who may not know Jesus yet, my encouragement to you today is to give your life to Christ. The door for salvation is open, but it may not always be open. It may not always be open. There are many people who think, and they know the gospel, they know the truth, and they'll say, I'm going to follow Jesus someday, thinking the door is always going to be open as long as I have life. I'm not convinced of that. While you may have life, the Bible says no one can come to the Father unless he's drawn by the Spirit. On behalf of everyone here at Woodside, we'd like to thank you for watching our program today. If we can be of any assistance to you in your walk with God, please call anytime or visit our website for more information. Again, thank you for watching today, and we look forward to seeing you next week at the same time.